Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I won't take much of your time. What I really wanted to say, I'm Piers Cumberledge from uh, the World Economic Forum, and um, I have the pleasure of actually looking after um, and looking over a number of these um, subjects that we're working on that all fall under a broad umbrella related to human capital. So I simply wanted to introduce myself, and if any of you have questions or would like to understand more about what the forum is doing in the area, do come and find me afterwards. I will be here in the room afterwards, so please don't hesitate uh, to come and find me to talk about broader issues in the human capital dimension. And with that, I'll hand over to John Quelch to lead us away. All right. Thank you very much, Piers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, listen, uh, th this is the World Economic Forum, okay? When, when I say good afternoon, you say... <laughs> All right, that's, uh, we're getting there. At least we're getting there. All right, so w we, have, we have done a scientific analysis of the human capital on the panel, and uh, through that we have determined a, an order of participation which is a little bit different from the sequence on the stage. Uh, so I'm going to first uh, turn to uh, Jean-Yves from Publicist Group. Uh, and the reason we're going to start with, uh, uh, with him is because Publicis has, in the last uh, decade, transformed itself from being uh, a traditional uh, media and marketing services company to one that now has a third of its business in digital technology. Uh, and so the question to uh, uh, Jean-Yves is, how has Publicis handled the attraction and retention and development of talent given that technology shift in your industry and in your company's strategy? Well, thank you very much, John. Um, we have gone through a couple of transformation uh, over the last few years. Uh, the first one is the one you described, um, moving from a marketing services to technology. And the second one is uh, uh, increasing our exposure to uh, a former so-called emerging market mm -hmm. that we call now fast developing market because they have probably emerged a while ago and in French we would say they have submerged the rest of the world or planning to submerge. Um, so those two transformations have been paramount and today uh, those two strategic periods of ours represent an excess of 50% of our business planning to be at 75%. So how do we, did we get there? It was a huge transformation from a human capital perspective and we had to find unique people that could uh, offer the combination of what we call IQ, mm -hmm. EQ, and TQ. IQ, we know, uh, intellectual quotient. EQ is emotional quotient, uh, quite uh, uh, something you can find quite easily in the creative business. And technology quotient, which is new mm -hmm. to our industry uh, because we uh, developed uh, ourselves in areas where, similar to Google and Facebook, and we are competing with those guys in some areas to make everything more uh, uh, user-friendly, as we say. So a lot of uh, opportunities for new kind of people were coming from the uh, technology environment. And the biggest challenge for us was not only to give them uh, the environment of uh, an entrepreneurial company, startups. So the biggest challenge was more how do we live with a 56,000 people organization mm -hmm. like you do in a startup, uh, like you do in a VC, uh, uh, like operating uh, uh, like a venture capitalist in the valley and uh, trying to identify the, uh, um, the room and the freedom, the opportunity to grow from an intellectual standpoint uh, for those people. Otherwise, they're going to set up their own business, and they're going to leave, and they're going to um, try to invent something by themselves. So we had to offer them some freedom, but also, also some opportunity to grow and to be exposed to some of the largest challenges and opportunities that one can find on a global basis. And thanks God, as we are working with outstanding clients, uh, they found that opportunity, and um, this was strengthened by... Uh, some partnerships that we developed with the uh, Facebook and uh, Google of the world and AOL and Microsoft and others. So the nice opportunities to partner, opportunities to create, to be their own entrepreneurs, 
operating like a startup in a large group uh, environment. So let, let, let me just ask you, if I'm, let me just ask you, um, in this transformation, how many people were not able to cross the chasm, not able to make the shift? Um, you obviously gave them all a good chance to do so, but in percentage terms, what percentage of the folks who uh, you had before uh, are still with you, and what percentage uh, couldn't make it? You know very well this, this industry, and we are an industry with a very uh, impressive churn, and, and that's a curse and opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's a curse because we, lo we, we hate losing talent. We hate having invested in training and education and losing the people, the great people on that. But sometimes it's also an opportunity because we could adapt ourselves and we could suggest, push gently some of the people who were not willing to embrace this transformation and ask them to look for other opportunities. Okay. So today, um, even if we make a, a third of our revenue from digital, I believe that with the shift of generation, uh, we have a lot more uh, digital native than immigrants like me. Uh, and secondly, we have been able to attract and, uh, the, the new generation and the people who are interested into the uh, digital world. And I don't think that we have more than 10% of people who are reluctant. Mm -hmm. And we, it was a, we use some tools and tricks to create some positive contamination, okay. which changed our DNA. In other words, it was positive, and we have completely transformed ourselves. So some people will have been retrained, brainwashed, so to speak. Uh, some others were digital native. All in all, I think that we're in good shape. Okay, well, just one last quick uh, question. What, what's the average age of the publicist workforce? 28. 28 years old only. Okay. All right. Let's move to uh, Nikhil. That's a perfect segue because Nikhil is uh, with uh, Reliance uh, from India, very fast-growing and successful company. Uh, we know that in India there is a fantastic explosion of uh, talented young people. Uh, from a demographic point of view. Uh, how are you taking advantage of the demographic landscape in India, and what, what sort of challenges does Reliance uh, face or opportunities to capitalize on that the demographics of India present? Uh, thanks. Uh, what I wanted to say on India is India is really enjoying a demographic dividend. You're very right in saying that. If you look at uh, our country, we have... 60% of the 1.2 billion people now below the age of 40. And our median will stay there until 2025. Uh, what is more important uh, in perspective to this session is uh, this is 45, 55 uh, women and men. So it's nearly equal. It's not that uh, it's, it's biased towards one area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we churn out nearly 5 million graduates a year now. And you please note that all of them speak English. So recently there was a survey done in India and they asked how many people can speak or understand English. And you'll be very surprised that 40% of the population said that they do understand or speak English. And that gives India, I believe, with the uh, youth of the manpower that uh, we have, uh, to become a talent supplier virtually to the world. Because uh, if you look at the Western world, nearly 25% of the talent in terms of the experience, uh, the Western world will lose over the next, from their active workforce in the next seven to eight years. So for countries like India, that gives an enormous opportunity. For example, uh, you've seen the service sector grow in India at a rapid pace, and its growth rate is even higher than manufacturing. So that sector, I, if you ask them their average age of the workforce, it will be probably in their late 20s. Mm -hmm. For companies like us, which are in manufacturing, yeah, I'm very happy to say that our average age of our workforce is 33 years. Mm -hmm. So that shows the, uh, the demographic dividend. 
Uh, from the perspective of this session, I think there were two other significant points. One was uh, about the gender equality and the other one was about technology. And I'll just briefly talk about both of these. If you look at the service sector, in particular the banking sector in India, uh, if you look at the non-governmental banking sector, 40% plus of the CEOs in banking are from our women. You look at uh, biotechnology and you will see more than 25%. Uh, what it, uh, this is a result of uh, education, not only in India, but the, what we call the haves of India, of uh, wanting to have education outside of India. If you look at an average, 20% of the urban, uh, uh, urban workforce and 11% of the rural workforce is now women, which is very high compared to the fact that 10 years ago, both these numbers were below 5%. Mm -hmm. If you look at CSR as an activity or hospitality industry, anywhere in the country, this ratio will be between 45 and 55%. If you look at technology, India has gone from 40 million telecom lines to 600 million telecom lines in a single decade. And what that has done is, in a recent Time magazine survey, you'll see that 79% of the Indians and 65% of the Indians respectively will answer you by SMS or email and therefore they have access to internet automatically. So that is completely changing the way India works. Yeah. All right, so technology and uh, uh, the advancement of women uh, in the uh, senior leadership positions as well as uh, the demographic dividend. Um, let me just uh, mention to uh, our audience, our live audience, that it's possible for uh, uh, you listening and uh, viewing this event uh, to Twitter uh, questions or to email uh, questions. Uh, and uh, just to uh, give you the information uh, by email, you can send to hc at wef, uh, wef uh, Dot ch in Switzerland. Uh, on Twitter, you can see uh, sla uh, number WEFHC and Weibo the uh, same address. So uh, we'll take uh, a look at some of these questions as they come through uh, on the uh, Twitter feed. Uh, but let me just uh, uh, go from Nikhil to Christopher uh, at the far end uh, from uh, Singapore. And I think, you know, from a human capital point of view, one thinks of Singapore as being uh, a fantastic country in terms of its magnet, acting as a magnet for talent from around the world. And I think uh, the, the mobility of professional and educated uh, labor uh, worldwide has really mushroomed in the last uh, decade. Can you comment a little bit from a Singapore perspective on this? Yeah, thank you very much, but I'm really in a catch-22 situation because I'm a Singaporean, but I'm today sitting here representing a global trade union movement. Therefore, my take would be what uh, is the perspective of the trade union movement towards this question of uh, human capital development. I think at the outset, it is important for me to emphasize very clearly that we in the trade union movement recognize that continuous training, development of human capital is essential, essential not only to the individual to, to empower them in terms of uh, job security of course, and also, also uh, wage security, but certainly essential from a country point of view to make an economy sustainable. And this is in this context that we welcome this emphasis on the on development of the of human capital but there's a trend that we increasingly notice now and this is a based on the question of a uh, supply demand and linked to the question of uh, migration i think there are now many discussions about the movement of people both within the wto and even in the asean for example and if we look at the context of the uh, economic situation in Europe, United States, and in the Asian region, for example, you will see a supply and demand situation, especially among professionals and managerial staff. In China, for example, I mean, many studies have indicated that there's a desperate need for a lot of uh, skilled and trained people. So there's a great demand. At the same time, you know, the educational system and others are not equipped to provide the required numbers that are urgently needed. And coincidentally now, you know, with the problem in Europe, United States, we see now a surplus, for example, 
So this fits in very well with the discussions now about the movement of people. And it is exactly in this context that we are concerned how this movement of people, if it's allowed without proper regulation, will cause what we call the race to the bottom, where in the end, you know, the, the standard of, uh, uh, I mean, the standard for professional managers and stuff, not only in the region, but also in other regions, will be correspondingly affected by this supply and demand situation. Therefore, we think, you know, in discussing human capital, we also must take into, take into consideration the fact that it is more than just equipping a, weak, a, a, a worker or professional with the skills and others. It is also to ensure that it empower them in terms of the employability and most important, I think, in terms of the, uh, the capacity to earn and also to maintain a decent standard of living. So, I will, I will, yeah. Do, 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 do you feel that there is a significant brain drain still from uh, emerging economies into the developed world, or I, do you feel that uh, the growth and trajectory of the world economy I, has it now working in the other direction? I think it's definitely on the reverse, and this is this is the problem now. You know, imagine you know those those uh, people in the in the emerging economies and others having worked hard to try to achieve an educational standard, and all of a sudden now they face competitions from others. I mean, I, in Singapore, for example, this is one of the political sensitive the discussion that is taking place, how to control the flow so as not to affect. I think this is, any, is something that any will be able to talk about, you know, how, mm. how we are trying to resolve this problem. But certainly it is an issue that has to be taken into consideration, mm. because if not, it will only you know, further aggravate the, what is already a very serious social divide situation mm -hmm. nationally and globally. And do, do you think, you know, looking at, uh, looking at workers around the world, yeah. do, do you feel that um, the competition among companies over the last 10 years has yeah. resulted in better investment in training and development for ordinary workers or do you feel that the competition has resulted in a, a more mercenary uh, approach that reduces the investment in training well, I, and development? I, 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 I'm, I'm speaking in the context of the fact that there are indeed good investment in human capital development. What I'm pointing out is that this opportunity that arises now on the question of supply and demand may cause some employers, for example, even some governments to be, to be complacent and say, why bother you know, when I can easily import ready-made people who are able to work at work? And this is, the, this is the issue that I'm pointing out, that we have to I be see. conscious about it, not mm -hmm. to allow this complacency to set in and then to, to cause that problem, which we are really witnessing in many countries. Okay, understood. Yeah. So let, let's now turn to uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis Nally of PwC, um, obviously uh, overseeing a, a, a vast organization of professionals uh, worldwide. Uh, we've talked about technology, we've talked about demographics, we've talked about women, uh, we've talked about uh, uh, the balancing that Christopher referred to. What, what, what are the key human capital issues that you and your people wrestle with at PwC? Yeah. Thanks, John, and good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here with you. Um, you know, maybe just a couple thoughts to set the stage. Um, in our um, global CEO survey that we released at Davos this past January, um, so see a survey that really tries to focus on the critical business issues that uh, companies are facing. What was interesting coming out of that survey is in the top three issues that CEOs talked about uh, this past January, the human capital agenda was one of the top three. That's the first time that that issue has ever been elevated to that status in terms of issues, challenges that uh, the CEOs were really focused on. And so notwithstanding the challenge economic environment that we're dealing with, all the issues that are on the plates of the CEO, they're basically saying we don't have enough of the right people, qualified people, to do the jobs that we're faced with today. And so this is, to me, you know, a critical business issue that, uh, that many are really focused on. Um, and you're starting to see, I think, a number of organizations, you know, elevate the importance of dealing with this topic, you know, to effectively address it from a longer-term standpoint. Um, and you, not surprising, you know, it's, it's, you know, compensation and benefits packages. It's, 
you know, the types of uh, traditional um, areas that we're all familiar with about creating flexibility and, you know, allowing people, uh, you know, to, you know, use technology and, and, and some of the more traditional ways to think about this issue. At PwC, <clears throat> our average age is about 28 and a half years old, 180,000 people around, uh, around our network. And so, uh, you know, we, we uh, embarked on this past year probably one of the most extensive studies of that population to really understand what's on their mind, what is really, really important, and how best do we as an institution begin to address these needs. <clears throat> and I would give you the headline uh, for, for us coming out of this survey is um, the deal is changing. The deal is changing. And so what this group of individuals is looking for, this next generation is looking for, um, it's much more than just financial rewards. Um, you know, so you start with that. Uh, you go down the path of, uh, you know, what does your institution stand for? What is its purpose? What is its contribution to society? Uh, they want to join organizations that have a purpose that just aren't necessarily focused on the bottom line, the P&L, et cetera. Um, they want to have a lot more flexibility than any of us ever had when we were, you know, working up the career ladder. Uh, that's a very big, important part, uh, you know, of what they're looking for. So they want an organization that will support those kinds of choices that, uh, that they're really looking for. They want to be able to give back to the community, right? That's a very important part of, you know, their role, their purpose, as they think about, you know, what, uh, what's important to them. And lastly, they want to have their own personal life. Uh, they don't want to be, you know, anchored down, you know, at, uh, you know, a desk or a computer or whatever uh, that historically has been, been the case. And what's interesting about this study is that you would think, well, maybe there is some real distinctions between those that are in a developed market or a developing market, I will tell you, no way. This is the common themes that are really, you know, across uh, this generation. And uh, so I think it's very interesting. It's given us a lot to think about in terms of, you know, how, you know, we need to address many of these things. I describe it as this generation of workers wants to have it all. And, and, and how do you figure all that out and create an environment that allows individuals to really prosper the way and develop the way they want to as individuals, which I think is a real challenge. The last comment I would make is, um, and for dialogues that we're having with many of our clients, um, we, we think the human capital agenda is so important and so critical and so strategic that it needs to be owned by the CEO. In other words, historically, you know, this debate, this discussion, never really was in the C-suite the way we think it needs to be today. So it is as important as the whole issue of, you know, innovation, uh, you know, new manufacturing facilities, um, you know, any other big strategic issue that's facing an organization. If the CEO doesn't own that agenda and really drive it from a leadership standpoint, it's pretty hard to see how you'll create the environment, the culture, uh, that's really necessary to not only attract the real talent that you need to be competitive, but also, more importantly, retain that talent. Okay. Uh, Dennis, if I can ju just follow up on uh, the Generation Y for a moment. Yeah. Uh, are there uh, perhaps two or three uh, particular best practices that you could share? I'm sure many offices in the PwC network have come up with, you know, particularly creative ideas to attract or retain talent in that age range. Yeah. Could you just share a couple with us? Two things, John. I, I would say um, the hardest thing for us in a professional services firm is creating an environment that really allows our people to have a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, we're there to serve our clients. Uh, you know, we don't control the schedules. We don't control deadlines. And so how you create an environment that takes all of the issues I talked about and allows people to control their schedule as best they can really requires a different way to work is the best way to describe it. And so the organization needs to understand that this is important. 
It needs to think about how they team differently. Uh, other members of the team need to step in when someone's got to go to a soccer game or whatever event that's you know of, of need to them, so they're not there uh, you know at a moment's notice. It requires a different way to really work together, and our most effective teams understand that they're all in it together. This isn't one versus somebody else all in it together to create the kind of environment that is really necessary. I'd say the other thing that we're, we're doing, which um, is a pilot, which is a very interesting, um, again, using technology, um, this group, uh, this millennial group, is probably the most technologically advanced group we've ever seen. Uh, you know, I don't know if they were born with a computer, but it certainly seems that way to me. Uh, and so how they network, how they communicate, how they interact uh, is, you know, very different than the way we collectively have. So we have uh, software that we're using within the organization that allows this group to collaborate in any part of the world on issues, concerns, building relationships, et cetera, that uh, is designed to connect the organization through a form of social media is the best way I can describe it. So I think it requires, if you're going to create the right kind of open, flexible environment, it requires all of us to think very differently about, uh, you know, how best to get that accomplished. Okay. All right. Th thanks a lot, uh, Den thanks a lot, Dennis. Uh, so now uh, we go to uh, Annie, who uh, is a great friend of the forum. I think many of you know Annie and uh, longtime uh, uh, expert academic uh, from uh, Singapore in, in the area of uh, human capital and uh, finance as well. Uh, so Annie, we've pull it together a little bit for us what you've heard uh, so far, and perhaps uh, a little bit more on the issue of women. Uh, in the uh, human capital pool would also be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. You know, I was a little bit disappointed because when I was moderating the future of finance, the room is packed. But when uh, we are having the future of human capital, uh, we see a lot of empty seats and it's filling up now. But I want to tell you, this is a very important topic. And I think, Dennis, you mentioned it. Uh, it should be owned not by CEOs alone. It should be owned by educators. It should be owned by governments. And it should be owned by private sector. And I'm very convinced about that because it could be the strategic competitive advantage in many countries, and people may not realize it. But in Singapore, we have no resources, and human capital is the only piece of asset that we have. And we are very challenged. I think Christopher was going to tell you uh, one of the biggest challenges right now is goods flow, funds flow very easily, but human capital can be blocked. It cannot flow as easily. And when it comes to difficult times, people do get protectionists, and it's in the area of human capital movements. And uh, one of our challenges, not just Singapore, but many of the countries that have transformed from manufacturing to service is that a lot of relearning has to take place. I think, uh, Eves, when you talk about have EQ, have IQ, have TQ, you'll be fine. Sorry, you have all the cues and you can still lose a job. And one of our challenges has been uh, many of our young people, we are against the trend, we don't have that many young people, but when you are 45 to about 60, you are finding it a struggle to be given a second chance. And I think that was what Chris was trying to say, that increasingly you do have the other way around, not the Gen Y, but the baby boomers baby boomer. trying to find for themselves a new career pathway. And we need multiple career pathways. And I think when a private equity start putting investments in education, my biggest worry is they are just putting it in the form of degree programs and coming up with more IB or A-level programs and more of the same. But they should be investing in competency. They should be in skills and our PMATs, what we call the professional managers, engineers, need retraining. And uh, I get very excited when I saw some of the things that industry are doing with educationists to rebuild the skills. And you should be given a chance to go back to school to relearn so that you have a different life cycle, you're a different career pathway from your first degree program. So you, you need not go back for another paper chase, but you're going back for something that's meaningful, engaging, and you could start all over again. 
So I think the conversation in this forum should break the mold. We shouldn't be talking about um, the different types of education. We're talking about collaboration. We should be talking about cross-border uh, investments that can take human capital to the next level. I know I should be stopping, but John, that you got uh, me carried away. No, no, no. You, you, you have to talk about women before yes. you can relax. Okay. If you don't talk about women, I you'll never Nikhil relax was, any. Nikhil so, was talking about women, so, so I was no, giving no, no, him no. the credit. Get, get the women thing out okay. of your system. Okay. I need to get a women thing out of my system, as John correctly pointed out. Because uh, if you look at the data in any country, women and men all go to school in the same ratio. You have 50% of your human capital in the other gender, the women gender. And I think when we come to addressing the gaps in gender, health, it gets covered quite well. Education, it gets covered quite well. But somehow in the business sector, we don't get that many women in leadership positions. And because of this implied discrepancy, when we look for women on boards, we don't find many women who are in leadership position who get selected to be on the boards of companies. And everyone use a cop-out. They say, let's not bring in the gender factor. Let's talk about diversity. And I think we need to carry the bull on the horns. And I really thought Malaysia was wonderful to set a quota. I was resisting the whole quota concept for a long time. And we keep saying there must be a diverse board. But I think that's a cop-out because people are saying diversity means you bring the old, the young, the handicap, inclusiveness, but they never want to address the gender gap. And the gender gap has to be addressed because if you look at the WEF reports, companies who have women on board somewhere, somehow, over the long term, they do get very competitive. And likewise with countries. So I really think we should not, um, we should start addressing this issue directly as well. Thank okay, you. good. <clears throat> so let, let, let me uh, just ask you a question on the previous um, topic, um, the issue of uh, reskilling. Um, and I just wonder, uh, what we see in developed economies is literally millions of people who are um, not able uh, to be reskilled. Do, do you agree with that, or is it that we just haven't made enough effort or the right effort to uh, help them find their way? I think, I'm um, sorry, John, I have to disagree with you. I think that there. No, it was a question. It was a question. <laughs> Great. Um, reskilling takes two hands it takes a government investment. And so you might even have to tell the people who have already got first bite of the cherry that the government needs to come in and reinvest in competency-based training. And the world is changing so fast. So I've got engineers who are now operating hospitals, and they have to relearn what healthcare is all about. So they have the basic engineering skills, but they need to relearn the industry and the no domain area. And I think if hospitals are really in need, of talented people, then they have to co-invest. So the co-investment model is what I'm looking for. You asked earlier if there's enough training in, on companies. Yes, companies send a lot of people to executive education, which I looked after for the last 12 years. I've now set up a center for professional studies because while it's great to have two week, three weeks program on soft skills, team building, managing complexity, cross-border, cross-cultural, you still need a pillar of knowledge. You need deep knowledge in a particular domain area. And I think to invest in that, we need collaboration between government and private sector, and universities have to change. Universities have to realize that it's not called a trade school. When you build competencies and skills, it's a lot of learning and you need not tell yourself that this is not rigorous. So you could tell I'm a very different academy. I feel very strongly that universities should not sit on their high horses and say that this is trait and we should not get involved. Um, there's a room for every 30 and for public, private, and academic partnership. Dennis? You know, Annie, just to build on that, I mean, this, this point about, this, this isn't just about governments or business, uh, I mean, to me, you also have to involve the individual in this process as well, because I really do think the model is fundamentally changed. I think the notion of 
you know, acquiring a skill or a profession or, uh, you know, if the way we used to think about this in the past, uh, those days are long gone. Uh, the, and so the individual also then has to take responsibility for his or her own self-development. That's got to be as uh, important a part of this issue as anything. And I think sometimes that's often missing, you know, in terms of, you know, what are the skills that you think you're going to need five, eight years down the road here, and if you're not thinking about that together with either your company or your governments or the educational institutions, we've got a real void here because this world is just going to get faster and faster and faster, and therefore the likelihood of being able to just step back and say, aha, I've got this skill and it's going to be always relevant, you know, I think people are going to find that wake up one morning and find out they're pretty obsolete. So I think it's a, to a total picture of how we need to think about this skills question. <clears throat> All right. I, I think we've had a great uh, set of introductory comments, uh, put a lot of issues on the table. I want to, uh, before going to the audience, I want to acknowledge uh, Angel Cabrera, who is uh, the rapporteur for uh, uh, the uh, session, uh, who is uh, formerly the head of the Thunderbird uh, Business School in America and uh, now president of George Mason University uh, outside of Washington. Um, now, we're going to go to uh, some questions. So. Um, you know, I have a, I have a very old-fashioned definition of a question, uh, which is a single sentence that ends with a question mark. <laughs> so, you know, I don't want to call on someone unless they can discipline themselves to that standard, okay? So don't put your hand up until you've really framed the question in that way. A single sentence ending with a question mark. It so, who, who, question. who, no, it can't be a long question. Only, only three <laughs> points of punctuation during the <laughs> sentence. All right, we're going to go to the gentleman at the back. Don't let me down, okay? <laughs> Don't let me down. And uh, tell us who you are, who you'd like to address the question to. Okay. Uh, uh, my name is Mohammed Al Sheikh from Olayan Group, Saudi Arabia. Uh, I, you know, I'm just uh, addressing it to whoever thinks, you know, he's, he's, he's better uh, to answer that question. One of the challenges we face in Saudi Arabia is, is the, the mismatch between the skills that the private sector, which is supposed to be the biggest employer, and the, the, you know, what has been produced by the, the, the educational system, mainly the vocational training. And I was surprised to know some of the countries, inclu including the U.S., that this mismatch is even exist there in, in some of the advanced countries like European countries where the unemployment is high, but of the problem caused because of the mismatch between the skills required. So my question to you is, is this the responsibility of the government, the educational system, whether it's you know, universities or vocational training or the private sectors or all of the above? All right, so it's a great question. Uh, is, the, uh, is the government through the uh, vocational and skills training sector really supplying what uh, is needed for uh, economic development? Um, now, I'll give Annie a chance in a moment, but who else would like to have a go on this one? Okay, Johnny. Johnny. I, I believe that as the world is moving faster and faster, we have to be prepared to give uh, the young students not only the first education, the first training, the first element of background, but an ability to learn and relearn over time. If, if the uh, education that is provided by the government uh, to the young kids is too narrow, it will be very difficult for themselves to adapt every other year, every 10 years to a new job. So from my perspective, I don't think it is the responsibility of the government to train and educate uh, the young generation for nothing else but a very broad an ability to learn. Mm -hmm. Not a special learning, not a special focus, but being capable of relearning, reshaping themselves over and over again. And if they have those kind of skills, this ability to reinvent themselves, then they will be in a much better position every 10 years to learn a new job, to learn to enter into new technologies, new opportunities, uh, rather than being just trained as uh, on a specific job. And I think that there are different roles, different kind of responsibilities to the government, to the educational system to provide the basics, 
the foundations and to the uh, uh, industry, uh, to the uh, private sectors, to provide them with a dedicated and specific uh, training for a specific job. All right. Uh, is, is there, in your opinion, recruiting around the world, is there any higher education system in the world that you would single out and say that country is doing a good job of doing what you just suggested be done? Very difficult because you can, you can find good stuff right. uh, from okay. all over the world. Right. Okay. Uh, who else on, on this one? Can we take uh, someone else? I, Christopher I have, first. I have to be a Singaporean in this instance. Oh, because, good. No, because uh, the fact is that in Singapore, you know, the educational system is as uh, described. The government provides a very broad uh, base to prepare the students for education per se. And I think the private sector kicked in to go into the specific. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most outstanding programs is the program that is now, I think they call Project Advantage. It's, it's, a pro, it's, a, it's an educational program directed at those who are on the, at, on the basis, on, on the brink of retirement or have retired to retrain them with new skills so that they are able to continue the work in a different capacity. But, but, I mean, I, I thought it's a very innovative program because for many retirees who want to scale down but unable to continue with a job with the same level of income could then do this job. So I thought, yeah, so it should be a combination of a private I mean, sector dealing I, with this. I just want to reinforce uh, the, uh, the gist of what the uh, questioner was asking because I think in most... In most higher education regimes in the world, you have an entrenched, outdated, uh, unchallenged group of academics uh, running things the way they've always run them and not really being ch forced uh, by either the private sector, the electorate, or their governments to step up to the plate, clean house and change, and embrace new technology. So I am very sympathetic with uh, the gist of what the gentleman asked, and I think that you know we we in the uh, in the university sector have uh, uh, a much greater burden of responsibility in this regard than perhaps uh, anyone else. But but competition will change the profile and the landscape. So I think um, universities are changing. So I want to do justice uh, to some of it. It's just that you cannot, you should not invest or private equity funds should not invest in, in universities and more of the same and just so, do a paper chase. So in, in the Middle East, there are emerging private universities that are challenging the, uh, uh, the outmoded uh, state universities to uh, bring in new youngsters and train them perhaps better for uh, the 21st century that they're confronting. So thank you, sir, for the question. Let, let's have another one from the audience, please. The lady in uh, the center. Thank you. My name is Silvana Kochmerin, a member of the European Parliament in Brussels. And I'd like to get back to the woman thing, as you called it, because um, last week, Monday, the EU started the legislative procedure um, for introducing a quota on supervisory boards of big stock exchange listed companies in Europe, uh, which means that 40% of the board have to be of the now underrepresented gender, mm -hmm. meaning women. Mm -hmm. It includes sanctions if you don't meet that criterion. I would just like to know maybe of the present gentleman what your opinion on legislation like this is. Thank you. Well, let, let's take uh, the reliance and the um Publicis uh, boards. How, how many women on your board, Nikhil? None. None. He said but, it very quietly. Uh, did well, you no, hear I that? I said it very None. <laughs> But uh, I would like to say something on please. the subject. Uh, I think that uh, this legislation uh, is meaningful when the GDP reaches a certain level, uh. and uh, it will be, uh, and and when you have a certain level of minimum income. Uh, for countries, uh, developing countries like India, it's very different because uh, there are pockets of excellence, as I explained to you, whether it's service industries or uh, IT or, or in uh, hospitality or, or, or even in, uh, uh, as I said, CSR objectives of all manufacturing companies. But as we evolve to grow uh, from uh, 
three trillion dollar economy towards a five trillion mark, you will see that this transition will happen much faster. Just like in technology, you saw that it, uh, India adopted to 2G after 20 years, it was discovered in the world. But 4G is being launched within the same year. Okay. And I think the same transition will happen. Publicity's board, how many women? I, I think that this panel was, uh, was very well built because we are probably yet on the other side. Right. We have uh, the largest representation of women of all listed companies in Europe, mm. seven out of 15. Oh. Uh, and um, this is probably the reason why we are outperforming in our, in our industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, Dennis? Just, a, just one comment I wanted to make, and this is the broader question of quotas, which I, uh, I, I for one, have been incredibly frustrated in terms of the lack of progress around the world on the whole gender question. And, and it, it just amazes me when we think about the demographics that we don't have better results. And quite frankly, this is a topic that we have been debating and discussing for years and years and years. <clears throat> and so I do think the question of quotas is a very interesting one. Mm -hmm. And the way I've thought about that issue is I think you have to be very careful about where you impose quotas. And the reason I say that is you have to be sure that if you're trying to drive that kind of change, yeah. that the quota that you're imposing will uh, allow the individuals that are going to be a part of that change to be successful. All too often, what I mean by that is all too often, if you impose a quota and the individuals that are then you know, in the spotlight in a particular role or function if they don't have the right experience or the skills to be successful, they're going to fail. And I think you do that whole agenda, you know, a disservice as contrasted to moving that agenda in a very positive way. Now, when it comes to the board, from a governance standpoint, I, for one, believe there are more than enough adequate females that should be on boards, and therefore the quota system would, in fact, or should, in fact, help drive the kind of change you're talking about. If, on the other hand, you start talking about, I'm going to impose quotas around CEOs or something else like that, then I, run, I think you run the risk of really, you know, hurting the whole process from a longer-term standpoint. So just a quick observation. So if, if I can just be permitted an editorial comment, I, I'm on the public record for at least a year uh, supporting quotas for women on boards in the developed world. And the, the, let, let me tell you the reason for it. And the reason for it is that when you don't have, uh, I, I, first of all, I agree with that the bench strength of talent is more than sufficient to provide candidates uh, for uh, boards who are uh, women. Uh, but what happens on a board, and I've been on 12 of these publicly listed company boards, is that the men on the board will say, what we want is we want a CEO or an ex-CEO as the non-executive director. And that just reinforces the status quo because there are no or not sufficient CEOs or ex-CEOs who are women. So this is the way in which men continue to fix this issue in terms of boards. They set the board criteria for non-executive directors to require a CEO level experience. And uh, I am absolutely convinced that that will go on unless these public, uh, unless these quotas are legislated. And I am sure that if they're legislated 10 years from now, people will look back and they will not believe what they were arguing over. Uh, because the, the talent strength, the bench strength, is just very, very substantial in all of these developed uh, economies at this stage. Uh, okay, let, let's uh, go for another question, if we may. Um, do we have a couple more hands in the audience? Uh, who'd like to uh, ask one? Uh, maybe the gentleman in the front row, and then uh, we'll go to you in the, with the uh, orange tie in a moment. Uh, please, in the front row. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, Liu Kaiming. It's uh, from uh, NGO uh, based on the uh, Shenzhen, and we dedicate to do labor law protection and work education. And actually, last two years, I also do some investigation on the human capital and the needs of work management. Yeah, actually, now many people think about the human capital of the worker, 
but actually who invest? But today we talk many this human capital, uh, human uh, capital development is about the uh, college college aid. But very few people are seeing many most of work actually they are very low education. It's less than nine year education. So it's uh, and uh, when second is vocation education. But most uh, we now we say work uh, the industry engineer have a have a development so fast, so most workers they only can do very simple. Uh, they don't need they have a uh, expertise. So they actually mo most most worker cannot learn too much on their uh, vocation. So and then I think the third uh, chapter is more important. It's about uh, uh, the social capital, as a, as a, their social skill, uh, confident as a membership in society, but no people to do that. But in China, we can see, although there's so many the people, as a special migrant worker in the factory, but no people to think how to invest these people, including government and the company. I think this is more important. I want to ask all, all of you how to okay. find a solution, special in China. It's very important because I think in China, the worker is the most important manpower to try China economic development. But now we can talk, many people talk how to upgrade the technology, how to shift the, the supply chain to Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, and now man, Burma. But uh, we say the, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, we say the, the capital can move it, but the people cannot move it. Right. Especially the worker. When China uh, have a, uh, we say from the uh, from one thousand US dollar now it's five thousand US dollar. But all the worker, is the salary is so low because the human capital cannot develop. Okay, so yeah, yeah. excellent so, question. How to do that? Let, let's okay. focus. Let's <laughs> focus our thinking for a moment on the bottom of the pyramid. Okay. Uh, the bottom of the pyramid from the uh, uh, human capital point of view. And I think the questioner asks this very uh, tough and challenging question in fast-paced, uh, very rapid change uh, world. You know, how can uh, people who are maybe not that uh, smart on IQ, EQ, and TQ, uh, and with all the investment that could be poured into each of them, perhaps not going to be able to do that much more if I, if I got the questioners just right. How can we still uh, invest in a way that will improve the quality of life and the social contribution uh, and satisfaction of these people at the bottom of the pyramid? I go to uh, Nikhil first. Uh, I will share the India experience because it's pretty similar. Uh, in India, a few years ago, we had a law that, called, uh, that was called in Hindi, Sarvasiksha Abhiyan. What it means is right to education for all. And this was directed at primary education. And what it does is there is not enough teachers for every school in India, but it allows the use of technology to broadcast and transmit those lessons electronically, as a result of which every school has a good quality of education virtually. And what that did is, it, if you look at now the Ivy League schools in the United States, you'll be surprised that the students are not admitted from Bombay, Delhi, Chennai, Bangalore, or Hyderabad, which are our major cities, or Calcutta, which are our major cities, but they also find from the second tier cities. And that shows that this, edu this effort is succeeding. If you look at the rate of dropouts from the school, this is reduced by 14%. And that is a measure, again, of doing this. If you look at uh, vocational guidance, what has happened, and let me again say differently, not only the government schools are doing vocational training, but there are several private companies mm -hmm. that are doing specific vocational training so that they can provide livelihood. For example, we at Reliance do this for our welders and our fitters and so on and so forth. And uh, I can uh, relate to a previous question that was asked that uh, one day I was in Saudi Arabia and I just made an advertisement of all the ex-Reliance people who would like to gather. 
I'll be surprised that we got more than 25,000 applications. Wow, wow. Let, let, let me ask Christopher if he has a view on, uh, on the question as well from a union point of I, view. I think it is important for us to also recognize the accumulation of experience on the job itself is also part of an improvement in terms of capital, human capital development because we have always been discussing that someone must go to attend a course, get a certificate, and then you are better off. But with accumulated experience, that itself is capital human development. But, um, yes, Christopher, I agree with you, and I like the question. Um, in Singapore, the two types of jobs that nobody wants to do is one is to clean up yeah. the place after you have eaten, mm. and the other kind of job is security guards. But in Singapore, you see so many condominiums, so many yeah. malls, so you have to up the standards of security guards. So certification was that process, and people feel proud because if I'm a security guard, I do get prior training and I get certified and therefore I can contribute and because my productivity goes up, I get higher pay. So you don't want your worker to continue to be at the bottom of the pyramid competing because they are cheap. You want your worker to have higher productivity so that you could pay them higher and then even if they lose the jobs which they cannot compete, it's fine because it's part of the transformation. So I think the investment in those lifelong learning can come from both private sector, public sector, and anybody else with a conviction, including from NGO or foundations. So I, I just give you uh, perhaps one small example from uh, CEIBS. We, we, we have 10 full-time drivers uh, on our staff. Uh, after I arrived, I went to see these drivers in uh, their smoking room buried in the basement of a university. And uh, I said to them, you know, you are our number one sales organization. You know, when you go and pick someone up from uh, Pudong Airport, you are the first uh, contact that they have with CEIBS. So you, you are our most important employees. <laughs> And then, in addition, we give them uh, a special bonus if they take and pass CPR training. Uh, we give them uh, more uh, money for uh, their own uniforms so that they can be smart and well-dressed. Uh, if they learn English and pass a little English test, they get an extra monthly bonus. So it doesn't matter what level of the organization you are. Everybody wants to be respected for their potential to do better. And so I think, I think we all can relate to that. And in our own creative ways, whatever level we are dealing with in the organization, we can find ideas uh, that will help improve motivation and uh, uh, self-respect. Uh, self all right, we have time for one more question. If there's one last uh, brief question. Oh, the orange tie, uh, gentlemen. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Annie. Thank you. Uh, a brief question, if at all possible. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. I uh, also have a, a question about uh, the woman thing, but uh, from a little uh, bit of different perspective. Uh, I'm a professor of Seoul National University, and uh, for the past several years, I find a very interesting trend that is the increasing number of female students in the best universities and the best departments. And this is not only about the numbers, but uh, it is also uh, that uh, these female students excel the male students. So, uh, and it is very difficult to find very good male students these days. So we uh, kind of have, uh, have a quota for the male students. And this happens not only in my university, but also in, for the foreign ministry they also have an informal quota for uh, the male diplomats. And we have a lot of uh, female students doing you know, very well in, in the bar exams. So uh, the female students and you know, the women are doing extremely well in these days, particularly for the young generations. Do you find uh, similar trends in your country? And, uh, if, uh, and also, uh, can you, do you have any guess why this happens in a in, 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 in country like South Korea? Do you have any uh, you know, implications for the human resources for the future? Okay, let, let me ask Dennis because uh, you know, you're recruiting thousands of people worldwide each year. Uh, how do you see uh, gender uh, playing out in terms of the talent pool that you're recruiting from? 
I would say the way you just described it in Korea is identical to how we see it in a number of markets. Um, <clears throat> you know, here in China, for example, uh, what the percentage of women, uh, Ernest, is what, 60, 60 percent mm. versus 40, a female versus male. In the United States, I think it's 54 percent female versus uh, male. And so you, you step back and say, in our business, um, you know, women typically – you know, are, you know, further advanced, developed uh, in some of their thinking, particularly around math skills, reasoning skills, analytical skills. Uh, and more importantly, what we're seeing today is women, when, when I talked about creating a different type of work environment, women historically are much more collaborative and get along well better with people and are more apt to contribute as contracted to men that are much more singularly focused, do it my way, and therefore, in a teaming environment, our women are doing much better than even some of our men. So um, I think it's a trend. I think it's uh, uh, something we're all going to have to collectively deal with, um, and, uh, but I think it's here to stay. So in the next 10 years, we may not need this conversation, Dennis? I think in, that's in what uh, years, Dennis is saying. Uh, one, one, one last comment from Johnny. In the next 10 years, we may be here to discuss how we're going to introduce some quota for men oh, in, okay. in, in some professions, but, but let's wait the next 10 years. Okay. I, I, think, I think when we get to this point in the discussion, it's definitely time to call a halt um, uh, since uh, we're obviously getting a little punch drunk. Uh, so why don't we uh, thank uh, our panelists. Uh, they've done a very good job for us. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming and for uh, the good questions from the floor. Thank you.